We've all got scars, some on the outside and some on the inside, but we can't be defined by our scars. I've spoken with some extraordinary people about how they become empowered by their scars. This is I've Got Scars, baby. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited right now. I am so excited. I have an incredibly powerful guest And we met in the most unusual way. I'm not going to tell y'all how I found him, but I found him because it was supposed to be. So right now we have John Rankin. He is a USA track and field Olympic team alternate, founder of Go Be More, and a motivational speaker. Now, when I say motivational speaker, y'all going to get some goodness is what I'm saying. You got all, you didn't inspire me before I pressed the record button. I was feeling all extra inspired inside myself. I was like, oh Lord, I'm about to go be more today. That is what is about to happen today. Like that's how I feel about how the conversation happened before I press, press the record button. So thank you so much, John, for being on the show on I've Got Scars, baby. This is exciting to me. This oh, is yeah. No, I, I and I got scars, baby. So I'm I'm honored to be able to share, you know, my scars and and talk about my journey with you and and you know, we don't yeah, we don't have to talk about how we found each other. I'm just no, going to say thank I'm going to say thank goodness we did. Yes. You know? Um what an honor it is to just be aware of your existence. I'm so excited just to right. to now know of you. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> Let's, I'm excited. Let's go wherever you want to go. I will follow yes. you. Yes. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Now, now here's the thing. I on this show, we love to talk to people who've been through some stuff. Mm-hmm. And you, my brother, have been through some stuff. But I would never ha- I never know just just to hear the way you speak. Like I I never would have known. So we gotta share the stuff that you've been through, because there's just so much that you have. There's just so much to share with the audience on the other side of the stuff that you've been through. So let's get to the story. Now, you went to UCLA, track and field, you're doing your thing. You got deals from Nike and all types of wonderful goodness. What, 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 what's going on? And then the road to the Olympics, go ahead and and just, just let them hear what 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 happened? Yeah. What happened? So I mean, you know, the journey started when I was 14 and I was very fortunate to to discover the sport of track and field. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've been it's funny, I've been telling the story a lot lately, uh, because it's just time to tell my story. Yeah. Um, but the simple answer in terms of my journey is that, you know, a dream was born within me. Uh, when in the 96 Olympics when I was watching Michael Johnson of the United States do his thing and those golden spikes with the USA across his chest. And I was a basketball player up until that moment in my life. And then I said, I saw what he was doing. And by the end of that summer, I looked at my parents and said, I need to do that instead of what I'm doing and Mm -hmm. and quit basketball after playing that for 10 years. Love my father. He is my hero, but I broke his heart. (laughs) You know, he's like, what? I thought you're going to be Michael Jordan. You know, that was that I switched from one MJ to another, you know? (laughs) And I said, "Um, no, I'm supposed to wear short shorts, dad. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and he said oh Hilarious. my gosh he said no 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 I don't understand this track and field thing running in circles getting nowhere and um I love that analogy or that metaphor for life because it's a lot of times we feel like we're running in circles getting nowhere but mm-hmm. sometimes we have to run in circles and get back to where we started until we finally get it yeah. you know um and some that and that's what we're doing all the time we're, we're repeating the same problems we're seeing it the patterns and until we understand the pattern and the problem yeah. we're going to be running in circles you mm-hmm. know and uh and and then we'll eventually hopefully break free and just be running down a path towards something greater and yeah. and i felt like there is this this underlying message as it relates to my life's journey up to this moment and will continue to be going forward that i had to run in circles for many years mm-hmm. and until I understood what it was that I was really trying to overcome mm-hmm. and also understand about myself to become who I believed I was born to be. Yeah. And track and field, so in many ways, was like the vehicle to discover what I felt was my greatness. Mm-hmm. And, and it was so funny to quit basketball. It's not that I didn't love it, 
but I felt something more profound when I ran. Mm. And so I needed to do it. And that's just been always my, um, my way of approaching life. I always listen to my heart. I always listen to my intuition. Um, I don't allow other people's ideas or opinions to dictate what it is that I know I've already decided I need to do in order to keep moving forward in my life because we're all connected, but we're also separate. And I feel yeah. like a lot of times we allow society, we allow family, we allow friends, we allow partners to uh, have too much of an influence on the decisions that we make that we know are right for us ultimately as it relates to our purpose. Yeah. And that's a sad thing to see, but it's hard to recognize that and say, oh, as much as I feel obligated to listen to other people, um, i.e. My, my, my mother and father, mm -hmm. if there's doubt, and it's not that they'd ever, they were always encouraging. So just to be clear, they were like, hey, to us all, oh, my brother, my sister and I, whatever you do, number one rule in our house, give it 100%. Anything less than that, you're not allowed to do it. Because mm. okay. they said what's the point of doing something if you're not going to give it a hundred percent that then that applies to anything in life, yeah. relationships, a job, a sport, yeah. an instrument, an activity, whatever. If you're not going to do it a hundred percent, don't do it. That's real. That's and, it, real. And, and I, and I, it was funny. My interpretation of it was, uh, I, I thought to myself, okay. Uh, they, my mom and dad said that they were very clear. They didn't mince their words, but I said, okay, so whatever I do, be the best in the world at it. Okay. Because <laughs> I said a hundred percent. Well, that must mean best in the world. I, I said, if I'm gonna give a hundred, I'm gonna be the best. And you, know? you did that. Yeah. And you did that with track and field. Yeah. So that's what happened. I I, I did a, I did enough to get uh, get at the attention of some really good colleges. UCLA ended up uh, knocking at the door, and I and I, as soon as I saw it was UCLA, and I knew I wanted to be an Olympian. I said, well, that's the school for Olympians. So I'm going to UCLA. You know, and there was lots of other great schools that I had opportunities to go to, including the Naval Academy, yeah. which is not no, no easy feat to get accepted. And I went through the entire process and it's probably just as hard, if not harder than getting into a Harvard or a Yale or a Stanford or Princeton, those type of schools, because it's not only academics, it's it's I was being recruited to compete for the Naval Academy. And mm -hmm. it's also it's a military school. So you're trying to uh, make sure that physically you're fit, mentally that you're fit. I mean, they're checking off all the boxes up and down. You're not just going in on ac academics. You're going in on all fronts. Wow. They want great candidates. And so for me to have been accepted uh, into the Naval Academy as well, it was uh, a massive full-time scholarship or full scholarship opportunity. And, and it was, it's not cheap. Wow. And I ended up choosing UCL UCLA as a walk-on. So my dad, my dad was actually really happy that I chose UCLA over the Naval Academy. He served for 15 years mm -hmm. in the Navy. You know, and so he's a veteran and um, and I actually was I was going to go to the Naval Academy. I, I that's how much I admire my father. I was like, OK, I'm going to okay. serve, yeah. you know, like my dad and, and what an amazing school. I mean, I'll be set for life to go there and graduate. I'm like, yeah, this is a no brainer. Yeah. Um, but my dad's like, mm, I don't think so. I think huh. that you, I don't think it's right for you. And wow, what an amazing dad to yeah. to to just. To, to, to encourage me not to take the scholarship because it was like, if it was only about the money, if it was only about just making an easy path, like, right, it, it, that would have been a great life. I would have been, I would have graduated as a, 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 an officer. Yeah. I would have, um, I would have, uh, you know, had a pension, I would have, all that stuff. I mean, and I would have been, you know, served for four years obligation, could walk out after that. I, I mean, literally set for life. I could do whatever I want. That's a ticket to wherever you want in life. And I and my dad said, ah, uh, it's not. For I think you. you need. Yeah, it's not for you. I think you need to go to UCLA. Wow. You know, and he's like, I just feel like it'd be a better fit for your personality okay. and and what you're trying to do in life. And boy, was he right. Yeah. You know, and so I ended up going to UCLA first year uh, as a freshman, and you ended up being the top miler on our team. And then um, as a true freshman, and I ended up winning the junior national championships and making my first USA team a junior national team and going to, going to Europe for the first time. Wow. And I was like 19 years old. And I'm like, 
I'm, I'm on my way, you know? Yeah. Um, and then uh, unfortunately the next three years I had experienced stress reactions and stress fractures in my lower legs and my left foot, mm -hmm. seven of them over three years. And that wreaked havoc on my confidence and the dream. Yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I don't think this is going to work out. I don't know if I'm meant to be, the, I, I, I was on a mission to be the number one miler in the world, a, a, an Olympic champion, um, all that stuff. And it wasn't working out at all. I was struggling mentally, emotionally, physically. I was questioning, you know, God. And I said, what in the world are you talking about? This is, you give me this dream and then you give me all of this, these, these obstacles. Yeah. I'll give you wow. the, I'll give you the secret that wow. I discovered looking back. I said, well, God or whatever you want to believe the universe, it gives you everything that you ask for. It, it, and more importantly, it gives you everything that you need to get what you asked for. Mm. So when That's I was right. like, I want to be the best runner in the world. God's like, okay, this is how it's going to work. You're going to suffer. Oh. Cause you're not going to be able to handle it. If you don't, huh. you're not going to be able to handle it. If you don't. You know, because I, I, one of the concerns I had, because I was actually holding myself back the entire time. I could have been probably the number one runner, Myler, in college, yeah. probably as a sophomore, junior. Uh, I think it would have happened a lot sooner, but I always afraid of the success. Oh. And so I think that the challenges I was facing was this is you can't, as I was like, what if I can't handle it? I kept ask, I saying that to myself, what if I can't handle it? Because I knew I could feel it. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm the best miler in the world. But I'm like, if I, if, I, if I can't handle it, what if I blow it? If I, what if I make it and then I blow it? I, I didn't think I'd be able to handle it. You know? so, so when you say that, like you don't think that you would be able to handle being successful and, yeah. and really being the champion. So you feel like, the stress fractures and all of the, the things that slowed your progress is what kind of developed something inside of you that says, look, I do want this. Is that what it did? Did it just kind of shift your mindset? Yeah. A big part of it was that, you know, I think that I needed to know for sure. Number one, it was like validation and, you know, the going through the struggle and not giving up. Um, and, and, and that confirmed how badly I wanted it. But, on top of that, it also helped me to, I think, understand and appreciate having it, right? If you make it and you get it, it's so easy to take it, to take it for granted. And it's crazy, how, actually, how surprisingly easy it is to take it for granted. But we see it all the time in celebrities, you know, people that make it in, in, in sports or whatever. They get all the way. And, and we don't hear a lot about the, the, the stories where people make it and, and then immediately they lose it all. But we hear it in some, uh, you know, with a lot of people that make it pretty well and then they fall um, like Icarus, you know, like the story yeah. of Icarus the, with the, the, the wax wings, you know, he flew too close to the sun and then his wings yeah. melted and he falls to his death. Yeah. I think that it's in many ways, we all kind of experience that Icarus kind of experience where we get to the top. And we immediately fall because we, we were unprepared to handle the success, you know? And I don't know. I, I honestly, I almost feel like it's worse to make it and to blow it than to never have made it at all. Because then you, then you spend the rest of your life in, in a different type of, of regret. Yes. And that's yes. hard to live with, you know, because yes. then you spend the rest of your life going, Oh my God, I blew it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, that's how pretty did tough. You, so how did you, you you got how did you get through that and said hey you know what look <laughs> i like what what was that that shift for you that I said, quit. i'm gonna go do it you're gonna believe my answer i quit ah, i quit what? yeah i gave up oh yeah i was not expecting that i gave up wow so uh my fourth year in college you know i, I stayed a fifth year Mm -hmm. is, is is the spring of 2004 and i was just like beginning of the outdoor track season yeah. i was just uh we just had an indoor season in um indoor track and field season and our team hadn't qualified for nationals uh, our distance medley team so it's like a relay team for distance runners it's a combination of a 1200 to 400 and 800 in a mile and i was the uh opening leg the 1200 meter leg um, they didn't really trust me to run the mile because 
I was still having a lot of mental issues, you know, a lot of emotional issues, mm -hmm. um, breaking down, crying a lot, just mm -hmm. struggling, just struggling, you know, because I wanted it so bad. I was so, I was too close to the edge that I, um, I was losing it all the time. And yeah. so, um, I, and then I ended up blowing it for our team. I ended up fading in the, in, in, in the opening leg and blew our, our team's chances of, honestly, they should have been top three. They should have been in, yeah. in contention for winning the, a, a title. And I was just, at the end of that, I was like, oh my gosh, I cried so bad because I blew it for my teammates. And that was so messed up. I felt like how selfish of, I should not have ran. Yeah. And, um, you know, they trusted me and to blow that trust was devastating, you know, and it'd been three years of building up to that moment. And I just, I remember being in the hotel room with, um, some of my teammates and I remember one particular teammate sitting with me, but they were all in the room and, and he just said, it's okay, you know, mm -hmm. and I couldn't believe how he, how much they meant that, how they didn't hold that against me, how they didn't how they weren't angrier with me. I'm sure that they were angry and I'm sure that they talked about it and they were disappointed, but I knew that they were there for me. I knew that they meant it. And I yeah. was like, cause you could feel that. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So at that point I was like, I'm done. I I'm being a, I'm an awful teammate. I, I can't mm -hmm. seem to figure this out. I can't get through it. Um, so I talked to my teammates when we got back, I remember sitting out in Westwood, we were out one evening out to dinner as a group. Mm -hmm. And I just told him, I think I'm done. Mm -hmm. You know, I think I need to stop and, and maybe lead the team or something. And they said, well, we don't want you to, but you got to do what you need to do, you know? And so I remember talking with my coach and I said, I need a break or something, you know? And he said, well, just take a couple of weeks off. They just separate yourself from the team for a little bit. Train if you want, whatever. Take a couple of weeks and figure out what, and let's see where you're at. After about a week, I went on uh, like a whole bunch of long runs. And they lived near Santa Monica, so I was always near the beach, which is my favorite place to be. And and mm -hmm. I would just be out there doing you know these long ten, twelve mile runs, slow, just out the thicket for a few hours, talking to you know talking to God and saying, okay, yo, like what is going on? You First know? of all, really quick, I just want to say I commend you on going and thinking by running. 10 to 12 miles like that just <laughs> yeah. that's like a way right over my head like really yeah. that is yeah. how you think I don't think like that at all like that is incredible so go ahead uh, <laughs> well you know I'm, I'm a runner right and, and, and it's therapy yes. and, 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 yeah. it, and more than anything it's funny the miles go by pretty quickly when you're out there and you're and you're having these conversations yeah. you know and you're really trying to figure it out, you know, and, and I've always been on that, 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 that path of like, yo, um, what is the greater purpose here? You know, yeah. how can I contribute to, to society and humanity? Like I, I always felt like this greater connection beyond myself to the rest of the world. And, 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 and I just, I've always felt this, this thing inside of me that I'm like, this is, you're here for so much more than you could ever imagine. And and I saw the running as a vehicle, you know, to get to this, these other places in life and, and, and in the world. So when it wasn't working out, I said, okay, hold on, what mm -hmm. is going on? Yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I was out there doing my thing. And after about a week, it just hit me. You're done. You need to stop competing. You need to walk oh. away. And so, and I, and I, and the funny thing is, it's like, and it wasn't necessarily quitting running a hundred percent. It was leaving the team. Just hmm. saying, okay, you're done. The UCLA thing, competing for UCLA, it's done, you know, and you need to walk away from that, create space from this thing that you've been forcing, hmm. you've been forcing it, and um, you need to create space from the confusion, you know, because I thought I'm supposed to be the, you know, the man, yeah. and, and instead it was like I was the, you know, crazy guy you know, the emotional wreck. And mm -hmm. I said, you know, I, I wanted to be a better teammate. I wanted to get back to the reason why I started this thing in the first place. Because truly the, the reason why I started running before anything else was how it made me feel. I loved to run. Yeah. I loved to run. So I said, I got I to gotta, I gotta step away from that stuff. And I said, I got to get back to the most important reason. And it was just because it made me happy. Mm -hmm. And I was not happy. 
Mm. And I said, I want to get back to that. I want to get back to John, this dreamer, this optimist, this, this yeah. lover, you know, yeah. um, this, this guy that just wants to make the world a better place. And right now I'm not doing that. So if that's not happening, then this doesn't, this can't happen. This, this part of that journey is over. So after about a week, cause my coach gave me two weeks, I just said, Hey, let's get down. Let's get, let's meet up. You know, and I sat down and I kind of explained to him my revelations before I said anything about quitting. And he's like, wow, you sound like you're in a great place. Let's, let's uh, get you back on a team. And I said, no, I'm here to tell you that I'm leaving. I'm quitting the team. And he's like, what? He was like, nah, 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 nah. And he's like, I can't have you quit. You know, um, crazy thing too, is he actually was always telling me, he said, I believe you're going to be the best runner in the world. I really believe it. You know, he believed it, which was really cool to have your coach believe that. But I said, nah, I don't think so. I think it's time for me to walk away from this. I said, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm not honoring this opportunity the way that it deserves. It is time for me to walk away. So he said, look, um, I, I can't have you quit. What, what will it take to have you stay? And I said, well, everything has to go out the window. I don't want to talk about championships anymore. I don't care about records. I don't care about Olympics. I don't care about nothing. I just want to do the work and I want to be a great teammate. That's it. I don't care about nothing else. If you or anybody on this, this staff, this coaching staff, tries to put expectations or obligations on me other than doing the work and being a great teammate and just letting me train, um, then I will not stay on the team. And he said, I'll let you, that's fine with me. Just don't quit. Wow. You know? And he was smart. He knew. He's like, yeah. it's going to work out. It's going to work out. He had, he, he had his own faith you know, in it. Yeah. So I came back and I just basically, the way I told people was, because what happens afterwards is pretty crazy. Um, it was, I just hit the reset button. Huh. That's what I did. I just said, I'm starting from scratch as if this is my first day running. I, I started from the beginning. You know, huh. as a fourth year senior in college, I just said, I don't know anything. Uh, I don't, I'm starting from zero. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I threw all that, all the expectations, all yeah. the dreams, all of it, I just said, that's done. I love that because when you think about anything that you enjoy, they always say when you start doing it, like whatever it is, like say you love to make crafts and you just love to make crafts. But when you start having to turn that into a business, mm -hmm. so to speak, it's like the fun the enthusiasm that you once had kind of starts to go out the window because then it's pressure. Now it's like marketing. Now it's like doing this. Now it's, you know, so maybe that really is what it was for you. It's like, look, I just want to feel like I felt when I was running down on the beach and enjoying the process of running and being so, wow, mm -hmm. that's really powerful. And I, I think that's a lot for people to really kind of get inside of them that sometimes, yeah, like the fun can go out the window when you're doing too, when you're, when you're focused on being great and doing this and blah, blah, blah. And just go back to basics is what it sounds like you're saying, kind of mm -hmm. simplify it. Yeah, simplify it. Exactly. And we do need to keep it simple because, um, you know, I love how you you said that, like, it's about like this idea of pursuing the greatness. And, and we think that we have to actually pursue the greatness in yeah. order to be great. Uh -huh. Instead, it's it, you don't have to pursue the greatness at all. What you have to pursue is the passion. Uh -huh. Ooh. And the greatness follows. And that's what I didn't realize. But it's funny. So I when I switched to the passion, this is what happened. Uh -huh. All of a sudden, you know, I wasn't doing any speed workouts. Like this is uh, kind of like somewhat of a requirement, yeah. but I was training, you know, for a few weeks and I took another week to myself after we made the agreement, my coach and I, but I wasn't doing any track workouts. And he said, Hey, I want you to come with us to the Texas relays. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, I'm not doing any speed work. He's like, ah, whatever, just come with us mm -hmm. and just have a good time. You know, just whatever. I, I don't care how you do Just come out and, and just, Work hard. You see, you want to be a good teammate and you want to do all the stuff and you want to be with the team. Let's just go through the process. Just come race, you know? And so I kind of had an opportunity to redeem myself. So it was really funny. So a couple of weeks or a month or so before that, you know, we did a, the distance medley relay indoors and I blew it. Team put me on the anchor. It was a distance medley relay against some of the top teams in the country. Similar teams that were at the NCAA championships indoors. Mm -hmm. And what did I go do? I go run a four minute mile anchor 
And I think I anchored our team to a victory, you know, um, in that it, we were like first or second, I can't remember, but we went at the number one team in the country. Um, and um, I ran a four minute mile and, on, as an anchor on our team. And it was like, where did that come from? But I remember running that, the, that race, uh, that, the, that, that those four laps that I remember it, running had never felt easier. It was surreal. And I was like, what? And I, every race that I ran, I ran PRs. I ran, I anchored our team in different, different, some of the different relays. And I had an amazing Texas relays experience. And it was like, where in the world did this come from? Yeah. And it was like, I was free. Because you I felt weren't free. worried about championships. You weren't, it wasn't pressure. It was no, just. I was just running. The time. You're just running. Yeah. Ah. You know? And so then all of a sudden. Yeah. It started clicking and then, and then had a really good outdoor season, qualified for the NCAA championships for the first time. Uh, you know, I didn't get out of the first round, but I was there for the first time in outdoors. And it was like a big deal because yeah. it proved that I was capable of doing it. And I was doing some amazing performances, but I still wasn't the number one guy on our team. We had an amazing teammate of mine, Ben um, Aragon, and, and he was the man on our team, you know, and I was honored to contribute to his success by being, a, 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 you know, kind of like a Robin to his Batman kind of a thing. And we were kicking some butt, you know, yeah. as a one-two punch in, 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 in our conference and in the NCAA. And it was like really cool. And we were in up being roommates our last year in college. And I was like, yo, let's take over the game. You know, let's have fun doing it because we were having fun. So it was our last year in college. And we're like, hey, let's go. Let's go break four for the first time. Let's break that magical barrier in the mile. Let's, let's do some crazy stuff. Let's have a big summer of training and yeah. just go into our fifth year and just dominate. Um, you know, and, and, and it was funny. I ended up having a much better year than he did. Unfortunately, things just didn't work out mm -hmm. as well as it should have, I think for, for him. Uh, and I've always felt, you know, like awful about that. Cause I, he's the reason, one of the biggest reasons why I was so successful is he paved the way it showed our team, you know, how to really compete at the highest level in, in uh, division one, um, uh, competition. And, uh, you know, I ended up taking over as the top guy in our team and um, it was one of those things where I was like really excited about the opportunity to kind of like take over the, the team and just really push our team to greater heights. Mm -hmm. And um, I trained my butt off that summer. And then I ended up just having one of the most amazing last years in college um, in history, wow. you know, and it was just, it, this is like a continuation of really, it was just this continuation of pursuing what I love to do. And I didn't add any extra pressure. I just was out there performing and um, yeah. people could see it. People could feel yeah. it. And I just went to a whole nother level because of what I had done that, that previous spring in 2004, where I let it all go. And I got rid of all that ex excess baggage. Yeah. Wow. wow. Okay. So you, just to catch people up, you were, hey, Yes, I'm about to go run. This is amazing. Okay, cool. And then it was just like you had some challenges. The challenges came. Then you were like, you know what? I don't know. I don't know if I'm supposed to be doing this. So you're mm -hmm. like, um, all right, you guys have a good one, deuces. And then they're like, look, okay, hey, hey, we can't be losing you. You're like, just take the pressure off. And taking the pressure off is then what woke you up it woke up something inside of you mm -hmm. you have the best year senior year ever and then some more amazing stuff happens yeah so i was thinking going into my fifth year it was crazy i was like okay yeah. um i wasn't thinking like oh i'm gonna turn pro I wasn't thinking about the olympics i literally was like i was done with all that i'm like i'm cool i i was thinking okay finish school yeah. Have fun in my last year, uh, cross country, indoor season, outdoor season, like three more, you know, seasons to compete for UCLA, finish yeah. strong, uh, honor the opportunity that I was given to represent the, you know, the blue and gold and, and then move on, you know, and I was yeah. like, okay, I'm thinking, I've always wanted to go into education. So I'm going to go to graduate school. I'm going to become a teacher. And I'm just gonna, you know, uh, just pursue that life as an educator. And, um, uh, you know, obviously God had other plans and mm -hmm. I ended up having an amazing cross country season. I became an all American indoor season. We were runner up in the DMR outdoor season. You know, I was trained like a monster. I said, you know, all right, I'm all in. So I'm just going to do whatever I got to do to see how great I can be. 
because yeah. it'd be fun. I just wanted to just push myself. So I started training and my training went to a whole nother level. My team members couldn't even, could, at, at one point, my coach was like, they can't even train with you anymore because your, your training was at such a level that it was like, for them, it was like racing. So he had to separate mm -hmm. me from them and say, you do your workout and they'll do the sim similar workout, but the level at which I was doing my stuff was, wow. it was just too much. It was like beating them up too much, you know? And so they, they couldn't keep up. So he said, just, just keep it separate. And um, I was doing otherworldly things in my training. And, um, and all of a sudden it started to translate into my, comp my, my, my races. And I went out uh, April 5th, 2015. I'm sorry, 2005, April 5th. At UCLA, we had uh, the Rayford Johnson, Jackie Joyner, Kersey Invitational. And this is kind of like when uh, I got on the map, you know, so to speak, in the track and field world. I, you know, they had a special running of the one mile, the full mile. Typically, it's the metric mile, 1,500 meters, mm -hmm. that they race every once in a while, they'd run a mile. And at the time, um, because they don't run it that often, the, 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 the mile, uh, the four minute mile barrier wasn't broken all that often. And so people are like, this is kind of a big deal when you run the mile. People, want, guys want to run this race because they want to become one of the, they want to jo join the sub four club is what they call it. Mm. Um, and at that moment, up in, in, in American history, up until that moment, there was only 267 people in American history, 267 Americans before me that had broken four minutes in the, in the mile. And mm. it had been 25 years since the last UCLA Bruin had broken four minutes in the mile. So when this particular running of the mile was coming up for us, it was a crazy moment because all of us wanted to do it. And, and Ben and I were like, we obviously for UCLA, we, we, we were the two most likely people to possibly do this historical thing. Um, and I remember the night before the build up to it, um, my teammate, my best friend in college, uh, Nick, he comes up to me at my apartment and we had people over and it was just like, everybody's getting ready for the competition and stuff. Yeah. And we're just hanging out. And it was like late in the evening and he just comes into the room because everybody had been seeing my training and he's just like, he just knew. And he knew me, he knows me so well. And he just comes into my room. I'm just sitting at my desk, just kind of just chilling, trying to relax the day before the race. And he's like, he just sat down on my bed and looks at me and he goes, you're going to do it, aren't you? Mm -hmm. I said, yep. And he said, I knew it. I knew it, <laughs> you know? And um, the following day, you know, the race comes and yeah. one of my teammates is rabbiting the race, uh, Mickey, uh, Mickey Colbrin. And he's like, uh, does an amazing job rabbiting. But you see him in the, it's the videos on YouTube. He gets way out in front and I just go straight behind him. And then, you know, the, 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 the rest of the pack strings out and I'm just following suit. But I remember the, the race is funny because people talk about it and um, everybody's like, I could just tell something was going to happen. Something special was going to happen. And I was in the zone. I couldn't, I didn't feel anything. I didn't think anything. I was just running and, and, and real smooth, real relaxed. And through a lap and a half or so, you know, I was just following Mickey and um, we come on the home stretch of the second lap. And Mickey was going too slow for me, you know, and it wasn't that he was going slow. It was still very fast, but I was like, okay, I'm going to go around him and just take over. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going to the outside and he cut me off. So I came back and I stopped, came back to the inside and kept going. And right behind me was, was Ben, my teammate. And Ben was watching and he saw, he said, the moment he saw me do what I did. And he said, the way in which it did not disrupt my flow, he said, oh God. John's about to do something crazy today. He could just tell. And he's in the middle of the race. And he tells me this afterwards. He's like, I just knew that, yeah. that you were, you were going to do something crazy, you know? And so I led the next lap and a half. We get to the, the, the bell lap, you know, and I see on the clock on the scoreboard, it says like 259, three flat. So I have to go under 60 seconds for the last lap in order to break four. And I just remember running on the, I just maintain my rhythm, you know? So I just was cool. And I just, run the run the curve hit, hit the back stretch and i'm going down the back stretch and i see my coach running across the field to the 200 meter mark and uh, as i'm going to it I'm, like time stops for a second and i look at him and he looks at me and he's like go and i just take off 
And it's just like, boom, you see on the, on the film, it's like, because this one guy was catching up to me, good friend of mine to this day, he's like one of my best friends. Yeah. Another guy broke four that day from BYU, uh, Brian Lindsay. Yeah. But I, I remember t- he's like, because Brian was actually catching up to me. And I was just like, I was so lost in the moment yeah. that my coach had to snap me out of it. And he said, dude, go, you know? Yeah. So I take off and all of a sudden, boom. Like, it's like a, I came out of a rocket or something like that. I just, that last 200 meters, I run like 26 seconds and I ran 357 for the, uh, for the mile that day. And I ended up running, not only did I break four, not only was I the first broad in 25 years to do it, I was, I, I became the 268th American to ever break four minutes. And I was the number one mile, ranked number one in the world that day, you know, and, and all of a sudden everybody wow. knew my name. Wow. You know? Yeah. That's incredible. And a year that before that, incredible. I was, and a, and a year before that, I had quit. See, just, but I love that you know what that shift was for you. I know yeah. that you, I love that you had to go back to basics, go back to the love that you have for running, go back to the love that you have. If you are, whatever it is that you're doing, go back to the love for it. Yeah. What is like, what's that thing that lights you up? What is that thing about music? What is that thing about writing? What is that thing about crafts? What is that thing about whatever that lights you up and stay in that zone? That's it. And, and that, and I love that. I think that's really, really powerful. And so that was the moment that people knew who you were. Mm-hmm. And then you move into like, we're talking about, uh, there's that next step. Yeah. And you leave UCLA and you're not about to go and just go to grad school. Yeah, no. I I dominated the incident belay for the rest of that season. I was the man. And it was like nobody could could every time I ran that season from the beginning from the beginning of that out those season all the way to the end, because I raced ended up turning pro, going to Europe, doing mm-hmm. all this stuff. I just every time I ran, I ran a personal best. That never happens. Like you maybe run one or two a season. I ran 17 that season. Every time I raced, oh. I ran faster than the last time. And everybody's like, oh my they called it one of the maybe the greatest middle distance season of all time, you know? And it was up there. It was definitely at the time, it was definitely like nobody had ever seen anything like that before. Wow. You know, so, and, and it was funny to stay in that place, to, to stay in that zone. Um, it was, it was just about like, I was just doing the work. I was just yeah. enjoying the process. I, I, I was loving what I was doing and um, it was just, fo- I was just focused on myself, you know, and what I needed to do to continue to be great. And um, it was phenomenal. A lot of people, you know, a lot of the guys, my peers, when we talk about that season, everybody's just like, yeah, it was one of the craziest things I've ever seen in my life, you know, like that'll probably never happen again. <laughs> but no, that's, that's incredible. So, so then where, where does the Olympics come in? What, yeah. is, what is happening here? Yeah. So I ended up turning pro. I ended up signing with Nike um, and, you know, I ended up racing in, in Europe every summer between, 2005 and 2008 and um you know nike i signed with nike just continued to train professionally lived at the olympic training center for about two and a half years as i prepared for the uh the olympics and um i ended up uh you know making the team as an alternate and was you know officially named to the team and and had a great olympic trials um and i was sixth in the 1500 meters but fourth fastest overall in the united states and one of the few that actually had the olympic standard which is a requirement to even be named to the team and um you know i did compete in beijing but i was actually i was on the team received the official gear and was named to the roster and all that good stuff and so you know in many ways i had achieved the dream that i had set out to achieve um you know obviously there's a little bit of an asterisk to it because i didn't compete in the games but I made it all the way to the top, you know, and I beat a lot of the guys, you know, throughout my career that made the, the, the Olympic final, that made, they got medals and stuff like that. So I'm like, am I one of the best in the world? In many ways, I was able to answer that question. Yeah. Um, unfortunately in life, it doesn't always work out that the dream as it comes true uh, or in, in ways that you, you expect it to come true. It always does. It doesn't always work out that way, you know? And so, for many years, I, I, I looked at my running career when I finally kind of had to step away from the game. Um, I looked at it as a failure, 
because I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't do everything that I had set out to achieve. But over the last few years, I've been able to reconcile the experience to understand that in many ways, um, it was better than, better that it didn't work out the way that I had hoped because it was never about that. But hold on now. Like, I don't want to glaze over the, the why it didn't work out situation because there was a surprise. <laughs> Yeah, a very specific surprise that happened that they kind of got in there and, yeah. and and moved in there that you did not expect. And yeah, what it's, that? okay. So yeah, the lingering thing, and it's funny. Like there's like tracing it back. There was actually always these indications of it uh, through testing, through physical tests and stuff like that. But nobody ever made a big deal of it until. Mm-hmm. a month before the Olympic trials <laughs> in 2008. Uh-huh. So at, at living at the Olympic Training Center, going through standard physicals, what we all had to go through, and all the athletes living at the center before the trials, our, our Olympic trials, whatever sport we were doing. And I, I did my physical and, you know, I thought everything was cool, but you had to go in and get the clearance, like, hey, see your trainer or whatever. And, and they just confirm, yep, pass your physical, everything's great, you're mm-hmm. good to go. Well, when I went in to go see the, the trainer, typically there's only one person in the room. When I walked into the room, you know, the door's closed, so you go into the room in the training center to have your private you know, you know, meeting with your physician or, or trainer or whatever. It was a full room full of people. And I said, all right, well, this is not good already. This is bad. Hmm. You know, so it was like the head trainer, a couple of the other uh, student trainers, a couple of doctors, I think that, I don't know who else was in that room. It was, it was a lot of people. And I'm sitting there going, this is a small room. First of all, so there's a lot of people already. It's yeah. crowded. I said, what's going on? And the head trainer, um, she says to me, you know, uh, John, I don't even know how to say this other than just to say it. Like your numbers indicate that you're halfway towards kidney failure. And we're very concerned. Um, we need to run more tests and we, we need to find out what's going on. And I was like, what? I said, that's crazy. I'm in the greatest shape of my life at this moment. I'm weeks away from going to the Olympic trials to make my first Olympic team. And I'm sitting there being told I'm halfway towards kidney failure. And I didn't feel physically, I didn't feel anything. So there was no physical indication to me that there was something wrong, but the numbers indicated otherwise. So they said, well, we need to run some tests. And so I said, well, what do we need to do? So they did what's called like a year analysis test where these like 24 hours, you know, over a 24 hour period, you're just having to, you know, use a tube or like this little jug and use, you have to pee into this jug for a full 24 hours. So they want to collect a full 24 hours and test that, 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 that sample and, and really see if it's, what's the full scope uh, uh, as far as what's going on with your kidneys. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the most, one of the most accurate ways to kind of like test things out. So we did it twice both times the numbers were super bad. So they're like, we still don't know why this is happening though, but we know that something's wrong, that the results weren't misconstrued in any way. It was accurate. So I said, okay, um, what's the next op? What's the next thing that we're going to do? And they said a kidney biopsy. And that requires, you know, being, you know, uh, somewhat sedated or, or, you know, and, 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 them sticking these big old needles through your back to get to the kidneys to collect tissue, a kidney sample. And I said, nah, I ain't doing that until after the games. You know, I said, I'm not doing any of that stuff. So we're gonna have to wait. And they said, all right, you know, but as soon as this is over, we, you, you're gonna need to do something about it. You need, we need to find out what's going on. Yeah. So I go to, I'm being told I'm halfway towards kidney failure weeks before my first Olympic, game, Olympic trials. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like what am I supposed to do with that? So I just put it in a box and didn't think about it. Yeah. You know, I said, I can't think about it. This is crazy. And so um, I had that news going into the Olympic trials that, and, you know, basically I'm dying. And I'm like, uh, okay, I'm just going to move. I got to move on. I, got, I can't think about this right now. Yeah. But as soon as I made the team and went to my summer of racing and raced all the way through um, the Olympic Games, I didn't go, but I, could, I was ready to go. And I competed in Europe. Once my season was over, scheduled the biopsy for sometime in November, and then I got my results in December, and I was 26 at the time. Um, it was an evening when I met with the doctor. It was like four or five o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, and down in San Diego, um, the doctor comes into the room and he's like, "Well, 
of all the things that you could have, I wish it wasn't this. Like, that is not a great way to start this conversation, you know? Wow. I'll never forget it. I'm like, what? This is how you, uh, it was so weird, you know? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you have FSGS or focal segment, segmental glomerulosclerosis. And it's one of the worst kidney diseases you can have. It's a terminal disease. There's no cure. And um, don't know how fast it'll progress, but it, when it gets to the point where your kidneys are eventually going to be scarred to the point where they're not going to function anymore, you'll be on dialysis, and then eventually you'll need a kidney transplant. That's your life now. So what do you, you know? how do you, what do you do in this moment when you hear this? I'm 26, and I'm sitting there going, well, I was... Honestly, the diagnosis more than the physical aspect of it, because I wasn't experiencing. That's why I tell people till yeah. to this day. I said I'd never, I would not know that I had a terminal disease. I would not know yeah. that I had issues with my kidneys. It, it, you know, without having gone through that physical. If I didn't go through that physical, I probably wouldn't have known until it was too late. Because mm. that's how kidney disease works. It's a silent killer. It's, it, it, you don't know it's until things start going wrong. And then, and then people are, from the stories that I've heard from over the years, from the kidney, uh, fellow kidney warriors, you know, that, that I've gotten to know, they all say the same thing. They said, I didn't know, nobody knew. And even when things were going wrong, like really wrong, um, symptomatically speaking, they're like, everybody's like testing for everything but that. And then they find out they have some form of kidney disease. And it's like, by that time, it's bad. Wow. You know, so I'm like, boy, I wouldn't have known. I would have had no idea without that physical. And um, so I, what, 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 what was I thinking? I was thinking I've sacrificed, chosen is a better word, this path. You know, I've chosen not to party. I've chosen to try to have relationships only to have it not work out because I'm not around. Yeah. I've chosen to live this disciplined life and, and to many ways sacrifice time with friends and family. I've chosen to pursue this thing wholeheartedly and to live a very disciplined, uh, regimented life. And now I'm being told that I don't know how long I'm going to get to do that. And if it's even if it makes sense to do it, I'm like, if I keep running, what happens to my kidney disease? Does it make it fa progress faster? Does it make it worse? Um, mm -hmm. That was one question that I had, you know, and there wasn't a lot of answers. It's the craziest thing about it is that most people don't really understand um, kidney disease, you know, and they're still trying to figure it out to this day. They're still trying to figure it out. Like they don't fully understand it as well as they could. And every person's situation is different, which makes it even harder to really tell somebody, this is what you should do, mm -hmm. you know, to deal with it. So I was like, at that point, I was up for renewal with my contract with Nike. I was contemplating switching running for, for the Cayman Islands, where my family is originally from, versus the United States. Mm -hmm. I was, if I was going to switch countries, I was like, well, I can't live at the training center anymore because that's for U.S. athletes only. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and now I'm being told I'm going to die. I had so much to figure out in that moment and I didn't know what to do. Wow. Yeah. It was so, very confusing time in my life. Gosh, like it's, it's crazy to be so high and then just go so low, like, mm -hmm. like in the blink of an eye. So, so for you, did is it just like, okay, cool. What did you do? Did you say, I have to leave here. I have to go and just take care of myself. What was the road to recovery like for you? Yeah, I just decided I wanted to run for the Cayman Islands. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted that to be my legacy. I wanted to contribute to inspiring the youth down there. I felt like I was, I'm proud to be an American and I felt like um, I'm always going to represent America, mm -hmm. but how it's harder to i think give what i was i felt like i'd be capable of giving as a world-class athlete to the youth down in the cayman islands if i didn't have the cayman islands on my chest if i didn't carry that flag around the track in victory you know and so and i felt like in many ways i was still anticipating being able to be super successful 
uh, even though I had just been told I'm going to die, <laughs> you know, I said, I, I, I said, if, 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 if it's, if it does work out, if I could still compete, I want to try to do it for the, for the Cayman Islands, you know, and I, as I felt like I would still find ways to honor and, and represent um, America, you know, and so that's the choice that I made, but in making that decision, I was then homeless. I was then basically, I didn't have any income because I, turned down the Nike contract that they wanted to give me, which was way less because I decided not to run for the United States. So I just said, I don't want the contract at all. Uh, no contract. So I turned down Nike, turned down the opportunity for the United States, uh, turned down a living situation. And now I had to figure everything out from scratch. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what does that, that, how are you taking care of yourself at that point? Like, where did you actually go and run for the Cayman Islands? Like, how did you rebuild yourself? Yeah, so I ended up going back home and, and thankfully um, the Cayman Islands, you know, was like ready to have me. And uh, I joined their ambassador program. So that replaced the income that I lost with Nike and um, pretty much completely. And which was great. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up running for them. I struggled though, because of the, the, the kidney disease thing. I didn't know what to do. I was always like hesitant, you know, uh, from that point going forward, the moment I was diagnosed, I was questioning whether or not I should still be doing it. Yeah. Uh, so unfortunately, I wasn't able to give what I was capable of giving to the Cayman Islands from a performance standpoint. It was never the same. Yeah, it was just never the same. Um, but I represented them all the way through 2012. I qualified for the, um, you know, the London games, but I ended up being injured. So I didn't go um, to represent the Cayman Islands there, but I competed at the Pan American games and was fourth. I competed in the Commonwealth games in 2010 um, for the Cayman Islands in India. And that, that didn't go too well. Um, and then 2009 was just kind of a little bit of a struggle. Uh, it was right after the diagnosis and I just didn't know what to do. And, I had left, left the training center after living there for almost three years and I was uh, living with my best friend's parents' house for a little while until I decided what I was going to do and thank, thank goodness for them. Mm -hmm. um, they've been like a mother and father to me since I was you know, 14, 15 years old. So they were there for me. And um, uh, yeah, you know, I had to just kind of navigate for three years, really, all the way up until when I had um, stem cell treatment uh, for my kidney disease and experimental treatment. Uh, I was just, I was lost. I felt like those three years was just so, so weird, mm -hmm. you know, just bouncing around. I went from San Diego, then I moved to the Bay area and I said, you know, they want to, there was a new track club being started there, professional track clubs. So I said, maybe they asked me if I'd come be a part of that. I said, maybe that'll be good for me. Mm -hmm. I only stayed for like six months and I was like, nah, this isn't right. So then I moved to Seattle where my brother was. And I taught preschool for about six, seven months. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then I met a girl. <laughs> and that's a big part of my story, actually. But I met a girl at a race in Hawaii. She lived in Orange County and I was living in Seattle, but something about her uh, spoke to me. And um, we ended up talking for a few months after we had met. It wasn't like anything crazy. It was just like we're just talking as friends or whatever, you know, interesting, long conversations that, you know, but have enough of those with somebody to eventually start to feel something. Exactly. If there's something there, you start to feel it. And I felt something for her. And I knew that at some point I was going to move, yeah. you know, to, to pursue that relationship. And so there were so many other things that I was just going through. And I think that because of the, because, you know, I know we were going to kind of bring this up, yeah. So I'll address it with, the, with, with in terms of the impact that this diagnosis and this disease had on me. How did it change my life? It told me that, you know, at this time, at this period of my life, the most important thing for me right now was to I think, explore other areas of my life that was that had been kind of like put on the back burner. You know, it gave me the reason to do it, to explore having a fuller life instead of just this one sided life of pursuing just this one thing, you know, okay. Um and so that's kind of like what I was given the permission to do because I was like, well, I don't know what's going to happen. I mean, I could die from this disease. Yeah. You yeah. know, um, and, and I don't know what it's going to be like 
if and when it progresses to the point where I'm on dialysis. And once that happens, my running career is for sure, it's over. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. So you say it gave you, it sounds like you're saying it gave you permission to live more fully. Like instead of focusing Mm -hmm. your energy solely on running, because it's were you saying that you weren't you weren't dating at all you weren't folk you weren't really doing anything but being this well oiled machine so to speak mm-hmm. for track and field is that is that accurate yeah that was it so i kind of yeah. like was allowed to you know given the permission to open yourself th- yeah open myself up to uh, other areas of my life and pursuing those other areas wholeheartedly um without too much reservation the dream wouldn't go away it's i still had the itch but it was like it wasn't a priority anymore yeah you know it's so interesting how tragedy opens us up to other parts of ourselves you know like it, it reminds you of what's important it's like not saying that your dream isn't important mm-hmm. but it's just like there are other dreams as well yeah there are other ways to connect there are other ways to engage with life and i think it's important for people to hear that like we're so a lot of times we're so trained to just go be great go be great and you focus in and you zero in on this one thing and then it's like it takes like a tragedy to make you look and say hey there's other stuff out here yeah yeah. yeah, exactly. And that's what it did. I think for me it was it, it did. It, it, you're right. It doesn't it didn't diminish the value or the, the significance of the uh, of the dreams that I had or that specific dream that I was pursuing. It just said there's so much more to life. Yeah. You know, and yeah. um, it's OK to also kind of like dive into those other areas of your life and, and maybe right now is the, the time to do that you know yeah. not even maybe it was like right now is the time to do that and it was like a yeah. clear definitive like moment where it was like you need to shift again mm-hmm. and um and embrace this and and it's funny like i always say like it, it takes uh, a traumatic situation in order for you to make dramatic changes in your life you know and we <laughs> say we want stuff all the time and until we're pushed to mm. do it we won't do it. And I'm like, man, you know, I needed that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, like it, it is hard. Cause I really want people to not have to have that experience yeah. to, to open themselves up, but it happens because we're sometimes that's the only thing, but yeah. maybe, you know, the, the only thing I could say is to listen to the, the nudges. Mm-hmm like listen to the little nudges a little bit more like maybe if you are a workaholic i'll say and you're just focusing on getting the money getting that bag you know all of that stuff it's like you might see a commercial or a movie or something and you see the couple on the on the tv screen and they're all cuddled up and it's like oh my god something inside of you says that's kind of nice you know that that would be nice a lot of times we'll just ignore that. Yeah. We'll ignore that part of ourselves and say, whatever, I'm getting that bag. I'm, I'm making this money. That's what's mm-hmm. important to me. Yeah. And it's like, you know, or you'll see a couple walking down the street and it's like, hmm, that's pretty nice. There's a reason that you connected with those particular things. Yeah. So I just, you know, I don't want people to feel like you have to necessarily go through the, you know, extreme lows in order to get it. But sometimes we're just so focused in on a particular thing that we're not seeing anything else. But like I said, those nudges, they'll, they'll come. That, that something will just, you know, and that may not be the case for everybody. But for some people, there's something tapping you on the shoulder that says, look over here. And you're just like, no, but here, I'm right here. And it's like, yeah. it's over there. So... Yeah, yeah. Just listen to the nudges is all I'm saying. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Because I think that ultimately we have to look back. We have to look at our lives and, and, and think of it in retrospect way ahead of time. You know, so um, I, 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 I tell, I tell uh, 
I, I've said this before. It's like I live my life in, in, in with the awareness of like, um, um, I'm not okay with living in, in regret, you know? <laughs> and so I, I, I was just talking to a young athlete of mine that I mentor earlier today. And I said to her, you know, she's trying to figure out whether or not she should turn pro and soccer and and she's like all got all these other great opportunities she's about to graduate from graduate school she's yeah. super smart she has all these opportunities and i said mm -hmm. you know just i said just let me tell you this much think about your life 10 years from now and we're and, and look back at, at your life today and mm -hmm. the decisions that you're facing and i said if 10 years from now you can look back at your life right now and the decisions that you're considering it's like you know the red pill or the blue pill kind of a decision. And I said, either one's fine. I said, okay. but if you're going to, if you're going to regret one of these choices that you're making because you didn't choose the other thing, 10 years from now, if you know that you're going to look back and say, I should have probably answered this question, addressed this itch. I said, then you know that your answer already. Yeah. You know, I yeah. said, so I think that when we look at these things, you know, my decision to pursue this romantic relationship with this girl that I barely knew mm -hmm. and why that was so important. That's a story in and of itself. Yeah. The decision to switch from the Cayman Islands, switch to the Cayman Islands from running for the United States, it's the decision to turn down a really good contract from a professional, from the best sports brand in yeah, the world. Eric, my, run, my friend said, you they are crazy. We're crazy. Yeah. And that's at a time where we were Hey man, in track and field too. I mean, dude, you're lucky if anybody wants to sponsor you, much less Nike. And they said, you turning down that contract? And I said, yeah, you know. And, and I said, because I have a greater vision. And I said, this is just, it's, it's not about, if, 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 again, kind of like what my dad did with me. He could have easily just said, go to the Naval Academy. Why? Because it was an easy yes. Yeah. I said, if you always looking for the easy route, I said, I guarantee you, you are going to run into a lot of trouble. Mm. Cause you can't see the stuff around those corners on mm. that easy route. And I said, man, I'm going to choose the route that seems right. No matter how treacherous it seems, because yeah. I'm looking for, I'm looking for the answers. I don't want to repeat this journey, you know, in terms of like the journey to the thing that I want. I don't want to go down this road that I'm, of, I call it a road of regret. You're looking for the yeah. easy route. And I said, that's all I'm going to do is regret the fact that I chose the easier route because I just wanted to get there. I don't want to just get there. I, I want to understand what it is that I'm doing, understand what it is that I'm going through, appreciate what it is that it's going to take so that when I get there, I could take that and apply that to other areas of my life and give it back to others too. And I said, the answers are always in the longer route, the, 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 the you know, take the journey. It's cause that's really ultimately what it's all about. The dreams happening. I said, man, the moment you pursue your dreams, that's when they come true. Not when you get to the finish line. Wow. Now that's a mouthful right there. Like the moment that you're pursuing your dream, not it's not because that was my thing. I'm just gonna put it out there. I was just like, look, I heard this whole life is a journey, not a destination. I was like, look, I, I'm not interested in journeys. Okay, <laughs> I signed up for the destination. Like you yeah. don't sit up here and be like, yeah, I'm enjoying this uh I, this 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 plane ride. I'm just that kind of person where I'm like, look. Uh, if I could snap my fingers and be there, I would yeah. rather not. I would rather not be on the airplane. Yeah, I would rather just you know, like that's what I want. And that was literally how I, I just thought that I was special somehow, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't have to experience the journey. I thought I would just you know, like that's for suckers. Other yeah. people got to go through the journey. I yeah. just arrive, and I'm like, woohoo! Hi, I, I woke up like this. Like that is really. <laughs> that was really what I thought. And I'm not even, I wish that I could, I wish it was a joke. No, yeah, that's yeah. literally how I thought. I did not desire to struggle. I did not desire to feel certain uncomfortable emotions. I didn't desire to uh, be in a space where it felt like this is hard. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know if anybody cares about the stuff that I am doing. Mm -hmm. I didn't, you know what I'm saying? When the world feels like it's crumbling and falling on top of you, it's like, I didn't sign up for this. Mm -hmm. And so many people have experienced that I didn't sign up for this, but they don't know that on the other side of the, I didn't sign up for this. Yeah. It's something amazing. And 
you talk about like the concept of really being prepared and being ready for for this ex another experience and i think that that it's really important because it's preparing you for something yeah and and so when i think about your story i'm just like wow let we got to talk about what you're doing now because i want people to see how everything connects mm. like your life connects even in the most even in ways where you're like i would never i never would have said this is what it's supposed to be mm -hmm. never in life i wouldn't have signed up for this if that was giving away some free free money okay i just wouldn't have signed up for it right you know so i what i mean yes you're a motivational speaker because i mean you you got amazing things to say but go be more where where does that how does that come into place when does that come into place for you as far as go be more goes yeah, yeah it was it was actually funny because it's been a 13 year dream you wow. know um when i was with nike a couple years in i fell in love with nike boy i was like oh my gosh i read all the books yeah. about them i got to go spend a lot of time at the nike campus in beaverton wow. um met a lot of these executives you know you know one of the head guys for the jordan brand i went to his office i met with i mean legendary coaches and you know got to know a lot of these executives at the top of the uh, food chain as it relates to my sport yeah. and i mean and they just loved me and i was like man nike's cool then i read its history and i'm like nike's even cooler than i thought i met yeah. some of the original investors and founders of the brand and uh, the company and spent time with those families whenever i'd go to oregon to compete and i'm sitting there going man this is like how can you not love nike you know this is so cool i mean and for me it was like a different experience i don't it's not just me going and buy Nike stuff because Nike's cool because Nike is cool. Yeah. It was like, I'm a part of the Nike family, you know, wow. and I'm getting to really know Nike intimately. You know, I'm seeing, I'm going to the warehouses. I'm seeing, you know, the mountains of shoes and gear and all this other stuff. I'm meeting the people, you know, seeing all the behind the scenes stuff, going to the labs where they're testing shoes and designing stuff. I mean, you know, you're seeing yeah. stuff that most people will never see. Yeah. And I'm getting to know my sponsor, and I'm going, wow, I'm, I love Nike. And so, but I'd gotten a couple of years into it and I'm like, man, you know, it was really hard for me to even have this thought. But I said, as a speaker, as somebody out there trying to spread a positive message, a message of, you know, still re refining it. But I was like, it's always related to chasing your dreams. You know, like there's something about it. I didn't fully understand it until, you know, recently, but I was like, something about the dreams thing, you know, is it something about having people understand what it means to chase your dreams, what it means to, to, to pursue your dreams wholeheartedly and why that's so important. And as I spoke more and more representing Nike and I said, well, does the brand fully speak to the message that I want to represent? Does this check mark, does it say everything about me that I'd like it to say? And the answer was no, it didn't, you know, and it's not a knock on Nike. That's not their job, you know, to represent me. My job is to represent them. Yeah. But that's not how I work. Yeah. You know, I said, I got to represent me all yeah. the time, you know. Yeah. And if I'm walking around wearing something on me, I, I felt like I'm like, what am I, just a, a, a cow and I'm being branded and saying, oh, you owe me or something like that? I'm like, no, I'm not an animal. I'm not just being branded. Yeah. I could take yeah. this shirt off and then what? I'm not Nike anymore, you know. Uh, I'm just John. And I said, I need something that represents me regardless of what's on my chest. And I said, uh -huh. I said, I got to come up with my own thing. You know, I got to do my own thing. Um, even if it's just for the public speaking standpoint, I needed something to represent in my message, you know, and yeah. um, so for some reason, the gingerbread man fairy tale came to me, GBM, gingerbread huh. man. So that's where the Gobi more comes from. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I said, Oh, at first, I was like, it came out of nowhere. And I'm sitting there going, oh, yeah, the little brown runner. I'm like, yeah, I'm a brown runner. I'm like, this is kind of <laughs> cool. And then I started thinking about the fairy tale. This cookie born yeah. into the world that just wants to consume him before he has a chance to be who he was born to be. And I said, mm. uh, 
that's our story. That's everybody's oh, story. My God. I said, Wait a minute. More than a cookie. He's more than a cookie. And I said, when he was brought out of the oven by the little old lady, he gets up and he's like, uh, I don't want to just get eaten. And so he jumps out the window and he starts running down this path. And I said, Oh my gosh, you know, from the moment we're born, the world wants to tell us who we are before we have a chance to be that person. And this cookie represents that. And he wanted to chase something more because there was something more in him that he needed to pursue before his life was over. And from the moment we're born, that's exactly what we're supposed to do. But that's not how it goes. Wow. For most people, everybody's already made a plan for you before you've even said your first word, before you've even taken your first step, your life has already been laid out for you by society, by your family in many ways, by the color of your skin, the religion, that your religious background, all this stuff is already predetermined who you are going to be when in fact, more likely than not, it's a misconstrued representation of who you were born to be. And we spend the rest of our lives being confused. And everybody wonders why. Wow. Gosh, that's powerful. I never, if you like, I never would have thought that, you, that those two, that that would have been the origin of your brand. Like, yeah. I never would have thought that. That is so powerful, but it's true. Yeah. Because you're supposed to do this and do it that way. If you look like this, you should do it that way. If you are this height, you should do it that way. It's crazy because mm -hmm. it's like we really do come into this world with a sense, with a lot more clarity about who we are, but we then get fed a lot of stuff that says, no, you're not that. And that's when confusion happens. That's when you stagnate. That's when you're, you know, you may be come depressed and all types of things because you're operating in something that isn't the truth of who you are. Mm -hmm. And gosh, so go be more is like, go be more of who you really are. <laughs> That's it. That's the number one, uh, you know, message. I mean, we could say, you know, it's funny. Go be more is like I've been told, you know, uh, by so many, you know, marketing, uh, minds and, 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 and business owners and, you know, all these people that are now involved in some way, shape or form in advising and growing our brand because it's doing yeah. really well. Yeah. And we're positioning ourselves to have an amazing 2021. The funny thing is everybody has said it again and again and again is, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, this is like the perfect, this is a, a marketer's dream. Go be more mm -hmm. active. Go be more <laughs> charitable. Go be yeah. more loving. Yeah. Go be more forgiving. Go be more optimistic. Yes. Go be more courageous. I mean, yes. they said you could do this all day, every day. And I all said day. the funny thing is it never will get old because every day we need to go be more. Every day we can go be more. In every way that you could think of, <clears throat> we need the daily reminder. We need to go beyond what it is that the world says we're capable of. We need to go beyond mm -hmm. what it is our circumstances say, you know, um, uh, are allowable. Uh, we need to go beyond what it is that we've been told or is the perception of what it is that we're capable of achieving. We have to go be more because we are trapped in this story that's a lie, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody that, you know, you could think of anybody in your life, I guarantee you, you can look at them and they would say, gosh, I need to go be more and they can feel it. And when they're frustrated, when they're depressed, when they're angry about what the situation that they're in is, it's not necessarily about the situation itself. It's about the fact that they know that they can and that they should and that they need to go be more. Yeah. And they are dying to do it. Yes. Yes. Gosh. That's so true. Mm -hmm. Because when you're not being who you know inside, whether you fully believe it or not, it's, but it's in there. It's, it's in there. It's already in there. And when you're frustrated with what's going on out here, it's like, because whatever's going on in here is not reflecting out here. You're not moving in that space out here. 
And so you're like, well, why am I depressed? Why do I not want to get out of bed in the morning? Why do I not want to go to this job? Why do I not want to do that? Why do I get frustrated? Why do I, you know, why do I have such a, a bad attitude sometimes or whatever? It's because something inside of you is just like, I am not fully being who I am. Yeah. And I want to go be more, but maybe it's, I don't know how. Yeah. Maybe somebody you talked to the, some of the wrong folk and they kind of stole your dream and said, no, thank you. That doesn't work. That doesn't work for people like you. You'll never be able to do it yeah. or whatever the case may be. Or even if it's a situation, like I know for me, it was just like, well, I have scars. So I limited myself automatically mm -hmm. because I'm like, oh, well, I can't do this because of this. Mm -hmm. So whatever your thing is, you're like, no, no, no go be more because that is who you are. It's already inside of you and you just got to live it. And you I, 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 go ahead. It was so great about, you, you know, you and, and the way that you now recognize the, your beauty, you know, and how honestly, I think that your scars make you so beautiful. Oh, seriously, you. <laughs> you know, and I think that the thing that is so amazing about your, your message and why it's so inspiring to me is because it, it, it's a very clear reminder um, and statement, really more of a statement that it's actually our scars that make us so beautiful. They do. They do. You know, and it's like, that's the thing that is actually your thing. You know, that's the thing that makes you great, that makes you <laughs> When you, when you said it's because of this that I wasn't doing it, doing anything or feeling limited. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's like, it's so funny. If you just, what you've done is you flipped it around and said, mm -hmm. it's because of this thing that I'm going to be so capable of more. Exactly. And, You're and, right. and that's why our scars are the most beautiful parts of who we really are. You know? Oh my gosh. You're so right. Like that literally is it. Scars make you beautiful. That's like, I, I have that in an email that I send out. It's just, they do. I love, that's why I loved like what you shared that, you know, um, when you reached out to me and you shared uh, your, you know, your, your music video, which is just like so phenomenal, so beautiful. And I'm sitting there going, it's so artistically well done. And I'm like, goodness gracious, like seriously, like you, you're a beautiful woman already, but the, the way that you portray yourself in that and the way you portray your scars and, and the beauty of that, I mean, it is seriously a phenomenal um, work of art and, and, and display that I think, goodness gracious, I mean, people need to see that video. I, well, I thank you. And I just, I want you to know about that video. That was literally, that was my first kind of, kind of reveal of mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And if you, and not saying that I hadn't, I had started doing the work to show my scars before the video, but to actually take photos to have mm -hmm. a video of it, mm -hmm. to, to, for it to be the focus mm -hmm. of the video, it was like, whoa, like I'm wearing certain things that I would never wear. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> that it, that was it. And I think everybody needs to have a moment like that where they celebrate themselves scars and all. Yeah. They celebrate their lives in ways that are, that are really powerful because they are powerful. And our scars can sometimes make us feel less than. They can make us feel like, oh, well, this isn't exactly in alignment with what I was told is the way life is supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, who, who, who is telling us what life is supposed to be? Who, who's who's like why do we think that it's supposed to be any other way <laughs> that's the that's the that's the question <laughs> like who that you don't know you use what you got yeah to to create whatever that path is because you already have it 
And I, I love your story because wow. I, I love your story because I'm just like, it sounds to me and you tell me what you want, you know, let me know. But it sounds to me like had you not had the experiences where you were on extreme highs with running and, and hadn't had that experience of, I just want to quit. I don't want to do this. I just want to have fun. I just want, you know, the pressure off. Had you not had that, you, you would not have skyrocketed in the way you did. But then it's also, then you have the kidney disease situation. That's like, okay, cool. Let's open us up to other things. Let's open us up to other parts of life. Mm-hmm. And it's like, but then at the same time, you, you started to believe in yourself to the point where you turned down Nike. What? <laughs> now that means you know who you are. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And then go be more. What are we talking about? You're like, look, uh, that's what, I, what I'm getting from this is you're like, look, okay, Nike, I love you. You're amazing. You're, you're powerful. But so am I. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go be more. Yeah. And we all have the, that opportunity in our lives is to say, you know what? Yeah, that thing over there, you're amazing. Hmm. Those dreams that mom and dad have for me, you're amazing. But I'm going to go be more. Yeah. For myself. Okay. I just yeah. had, I'm just trying to connect the dots over here. Hey, well, that was really good. <laughs> I'm like, hey, come on. <laughs> no, that's, that's it. That's it. You know, at the end of the day, what I've learned is this. Life has all these things that are going to come your way. Your journey is going to be full of all this stuff. In the beginning, you know, we talk about dreams when we're young. We think about purpose and what am I here to do and, and yeah. what am I supposed to do? And everybody has, a, everybody's going to tell you something, mm-hmm. you know, um, you're going to see examples of things you might want to do, things that you should probably do or think you should do, you know, all this stuff, these things are going to come up. The challenge is seeing through all the noise yeah. to see what's right in front of you. In fact, to see what's actually buried within you, mm-hmm. to see your own heart, mm-hmm. to understand that like all the stuff that we want to achieve, mm-hmm. it really doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. why you're pursuing all that stuff mm-hmm. is for one thing and one thing only mm. to know who you are. Ha! Yes. Nothing else matters. Cause at the end of the day, can't take the money with you. No. Can't take the houses with you. No. Can't take the cars with you. Mm-hmm. All you have is yourself, your relationships mm-hmm. and how you made others feel. Yeah. That's it. That's Everything it. else, it's just there to help you to understand who you were born to be Oof. and help you to get there. Nothing oh. else matters, you know? Nothing so when people think matters. about like, hey, man, the success that I'm having, the success that I'm going to have, mm-hmm. the things that I'm getting, the things that I'm going to have, it's like none of it matters to me. I'm like, I give it away all the time. I don't keep yeah. anything. I, I don't need anything. I don't want anything. I want my daughter to be safe. Mm-hmm. I want those that I love to be happy, to understand who they are, to feel like they have a chance, to feel empowered, to feel free. Mm -hmm. I want to protect, you know, um, you know, others in terms of giving them a chance in society and and globally in this country and globally. I want, I want people to see the greatness, you know, but personally speaking, wealth, wealth doesn't for me. Yeah. I'd like to have the money only so I could do good with it. You know, that's it. I don't, I don't need or want anything, you know, I I want to provide for my daughter. I want to make make sure that she's good. I want to make sure her mom is good. Mm -hmm. That's it. Everything else. I'm like, I'm good. I I literally don't need anything at all. I don't want anything. And it's because I know who I am. I always feel wealthy. I always Mm -hmm. feel Mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm, I'm good because I always feel like I have everything that I need and it's always there and the universe will provide. Like I don't feel fear like, 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 like I used to, yeah. I don't, and it was never really that bad for me anyway, because I always felt love more than fear. I always felt like anything was possible because it is, you know, and the closer I've gotten to knowing who I am to the pursuit of my dreams, which is why people need to pursue their dreams. It's not for the sake of the dream. 
It's for the huh. sake of knowing who you are. Oh, okay. That's your value. That's your wealth. That's your contribution to the world. Find that, do that, live that as much as you can and go be more of that for the rest of your life and watch the issues, watch the global issues, the, the problems oh. in society and your own life dissipate to the point where it's not even uh, something that we have to think about anymore. Okay. I need you to understand you said a lot right there. You, you going for your dream is not just about you. This affects things globally. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think people understand. Like, even if, if their dream is like, you know what? I want to open an ice cream shop. Mm -hmm. That's your dream. Okay. Now, I, I think that we don't understand the impact of moving in your dream because a lot of times we just think, well, it's optional. Everybody doesn't live their dream. Some people just, you know, go to a nine to five they don't really like and, you know, they're able to make it. But I think that if we understood how closely we're connected to one another. So if you open up your ice cream shop because that's your dream maybe this little child comes in or this adult comes into this ice cream shop. They see your smiling face because you're so happy and because you're living your dream. The ice cream tastes that much better because you, this is your dream and you want it to taste good for people. And then they're inspired somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, in your ice cream shop, two strangers come and meet for the first time and in two years they're married mm -hmm. like we don't understand i don't think we understand the gravity of how our dream and just sticking to that thing has the impact it can have on other people because we're all connected so i love what you're saying is that this isn't just like oh yeah you know i wanted to you know open up I wanted to open up a, I want to do hair, but you know, I'm just going to go and, 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 and work this other job. Mm -hmm. No, you need to do hair because you have no idea how you can literally change somebody's life because you are doing what it is that is inside of you to do and how that can affect other people. I had a, mm. a, 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 a guy on the show, a young man on the show, and he's incredible. He's a burn survivor as well. Mm. And he opened up, he became a barber. And when he loves the work that he does, because he's like, I can see people changing in my chair in the 20, 30 minutes that I'm just giving them a haircut. And he's like, they'll come in slumped over. By the time the haircut is finished, they're feeling like amazing. There, you know, and especially like during the pandemic, people right now during the pandemic mm. is like, look, haircut, grooming. Yeah. Like they're understanding, like nobody is taking a barber for granted. Nobody's taking oh, a hairdresser my. for granted. I love okay. that. Yeah, that's <laughs> hilarious. It's okay. like essential worker. You are an essential okay. worker. I had no exactly. idea how essential you really were. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you yeah. have no idea whatever the dream is. I love that this is about your dream. We're talking about living on purpose. Mm -hmm. Living that, like doing it because we need you to do that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's absolutely crazy because we only think about it on the biggest scale. Like one of my favorite uh, well, easiest examples and one of my favorite, I mean, I love him so much and, you know, um, is Michael Jordan, you know, yeah. uh, it, I've never met Mike, but I mean, you know, we all know Mike, you know, in terms of how he showed up in the world as it relates to being an athlete. And um, I mean, I think we all need to just tell Michael, thank you all the time, because it doesn't matter how tough he was on his teammates. It doesn't matter what the stories are. I think that ultimately you have to respect the fact that somebody had the courage to do what he did, which is to pursue wholeheartedly, un unashamed, uh, un un uh, you know, undeterred, un unquestioned in his own mind, like, yo, this is it. I'm going to make this happen and I'm going to do it my way and I'm going to do it as well as I possibly can. That example 
of just push, pushing yourself to be the best you could possibly be is, is, is amazing because not just because of what he was able to do, but the fact that he's like, this is what it looks like. He gave us an example and I'm like, goodness gracious, you know, like Michael um, gave us this amazing example of how important it is to, well, the impact, I'm sorry, the impact that pursuing your dreams can have on other people. I mean, who knows the countless millions of people of every background, and I'm not talking just the basketball, oh, I want to be like Mike as a basketball player kind of dreams. I'm talking like every dream. How many people wanted to be the Michael Jordan of? Mm -hmm. That's a crazy thing to have as an impact. I'm the Michael Jordan of accounting. I'm the Michael Jordan of writing. I'm the Michael Jordan of teaching. That's so freaking cool. Like that is now like a gold standard for every other sport, every other pursuit. If you're the Michael Jordan of, that means you're the best. Not only maybe the best is doing it right now, maybe the best ever to do whatever you're doing. That's what Mike gave us. That's, That's amazing. That's amazing. And what if Mike didn't pursue his dreams? What if Mike didn't do that? Then we would have been robbed of that. And yet that's the gift ever for all of history that Michael Jordan has given to humanity. That's pretty freaking amazing. But in many respects, it's like, it doesn't have to be that kind of an impact in terms of like, it's known the impact is felt. It's always a ripple effect because the moment you drop the pebble into the water, the ripple effect is had and it's like, and it reaches every shore you know, uh, of, of, of humanity. And, and, and the impact is like literally just be who you are and allow that impact to have whatever impact it's going to have, known or unknown around you. It's going to touch people's lives regardless of whether or not you know it, mm-hmm. but it's having the impact and that's what you need to know. Mm-hmm. So you have to do it. So for me, when I talk about our dreams are the solution to the global issues that we face today, I'm not joking. I know what the answers are to racism. I do. I know what the answers are to police brutality. I know what the answers are to economic inequality. I know what the answers are to sexism. I know what the answers are to climate change. I know what the answers are. The answers are really simple because I know what the problem is. The problem is us. Mm -hmm. But we're also the solution. Mm -hmm. You know, so when I say chase your dreams, that means you're going to give a shit about humanity because you're going to feel fulfilled. You're not going to sit there and feel like, oh, I need something. I need to get over on somebody. You're going to be so damn busy chasing your dreams that you can't help it but be giving. Yeah. You can't help but be forgiving. You can't help it but be loving. You can't help but be, but be supportive because you're so fulfilled. Your cup will runneth over so much so that you can't help it but water the soil around you with love. You better say it. You better say it. You got to chase your dreams. It's the only answer. Y'all want to solve the problems? Stop talking to me about laws and policies. They don't change people's hearts. They, Only dreams can do that. Okay. See, there is nothing more to be said because that is exactly it. That's that it. Is it. That is it. You better go ahead with your amazing self. Okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And so if you ever, whoever is watching, if you ever needed a reason to go for your dream, if you need a confirmation, you got that confirmation right here because, yeah, it changes you inside. And, yeah, if you're wondering why just stuff just, why you just not happy, the bu- bluest skies don't matter to you. The mm. sun shining doesn't, like, if who cares? If you're just not feeling, like, the zest for life, it's probably because you're not living your dream. And if yeah. you're not living your dream, even focusing and working on your dream, it, it makes you feel better than not. And I'm only saying that because I have been like, God, what am I supposed to be doing? Because I feel mm-hmm. like I'm just spinning my wheels. And tapping into myself and this, this stars platform for me has given me so much hope and it has opened my eyes to wow I can do something to help somebody else and it makes mm-hmm. me feel good. Right. So you know understand 
pursuing your dreams is going to help you to feel good and you feeling good helps other people feel good and all like it's it's a beautiful it's a beautiful connection a beautiful little dance so how can people get in touch with you john and get some of your amazing go be more gear and, yeah and, and listen to your podcast and all of that how can they get in touch with you yeah i mean the, the best place is just to go to our website go be more.co um we're in the middle of actually the current site is is going to be updated we're, we're we're growing guys and we're doing um you know working so hard to show the world that we're more than just an apparel company, but we want to be a great apparel company. And we're constantly trying to go be more in that regard. So our current site is, is wonderful. Uh, it's real easy. Just if you send an email, um, you know, uh, we're still small enough today so that I get all the emails along with my team. Most of my team manages a lot of that stuff, but you can email us, reach us, reach out to us through the, um, you know, through our website, you'll find, you know, uh, links to our, our podcast and, uh, to our different social channels. Um, and a lot of that stuff is just now like going to the next level. You know, we've been super small and lean and mean for a while. We were a team of like four or five about three months ago, and now we're a team of 20. And um, it's just a lot of work, a lot of opportunities that we've just seen. And there isn't an area in the world or an area in society, an area in life that we're not interested in finding a way to help inspire people to go be more. And so um, we have a lot that we've now really begun to, uh, you know, put our hands in and, and um, you know, dig in. Basically, we're planting seeds into the soil, you know, kind of, so to speak. And we're just trying to plant these seeds to inspire more people to go be more. And the website is the greatest place to just stay up to date on everything. Um, we do have a monthly uh, newsletter, and that gives you all the rundowns on what's, what's new, what's happening uh, for sure. And then, of course, our website has our current uh, apparel that we're selling and, even that's going to the next level. Now we've just signed a new partnership with a great uh, product and fulfillment partner. So we're uh, being able to do even more amazing things uh, from an apparel standpoint. And uh, the goal is definitely to create clothes that inspires you every day to go be more, to make clothes that allows you to feel committed to your dreams. That's the biggest thing about our, our, our brand is that we want people to be more committed yeah. to chasing your dreams, to feel inspired to do it, to be more committed to do it. So our clothes the function of it really is the reason why we wanted to do apparel wasn't just to do apparel because there's a gr lot of great apparel brands out there that are very inspiring. We said we wanted a, a people to see our clothes that when you buy it, you buy it because you're ready to go be more, you wow. know? So when you put it on, you're like, I'm going to go be more today. When you put on, you know, any kind of apparel uh, that we have now or will create in the future, you know, uh, it's your go be more shoes. It's your go be more hat. When you put on that go be more tank top or those go be more shorts or leggings, you're putting it on because you want to go be more. You wear that stuff because it's your reminder. You know, I say it's like a, our clothes someday should be like the wedding ring to your dreams. Like you're committed to your dreams when you wear go be more apparel. Right. And that's what we want it to be, you know, associated with. It's like I'm committed to being the best version of myself. I'm committed to chasing my dreams. I'm committed to inspiring others to chase their dreams by pursuing what it is that I was born to do. And when I chase my dreams, I become what the world is chasing and I hope to inspire others to do the same. And that's what our, our brand is really all about when it comes to the apparel. Yes, thank you so much, John. I am so happy that we connected this was amazing. I'm inspired. I'm like, yes, I need to go be more. Okay. <laughs> I'm about to go. Like, I'm so serious too. Like, I am so happy that we connected. Me it's too. It's hilarious how that happened. And I love it. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing your incredibly powerful story and letting your light shine on this show because you are doing great work and I'm excited to see the expansion. So, yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm honored uh, to be able to join you on your platform and, and uh, I'm excited to now know you. And uh, I promise you, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be a champion for you and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm so, so excited to know of what you're doing. And I believe not only in your message, I believe in you. I'm really, really excited. Uh, to work with you more and, and connect with you on what you're doing. You deserve it. 
And um, just, I want you to know, keep up the great work because it's inspiring uh, for me. Uh, and, and we all have scars. Yes. And I'm so excited for you to be a leader in helping us to see the beauty in those scars. Thank you so much. Ah, all right. Okay. Thank you. Hold on. <laughs>